It was the building that should never have been built, rising in the wrong place at the wrong time, propelled skyward by the same speculative impulse that had just been so severely chastised on Wall Street. And yet up it went in the deafening silence that followed the crash. And when it was through, though no one could tell whether it had been a success or failure, everyone knew it was the purest and most glorious expression of everything the city stood for. Long before the night of his fateful promise to Al Smith in the Lotus Club, John Jacob Raskob had been burning to build a tower that would soar above the rest. All through the spring and summer of the great boom year, he had marshaled his forces in total secrecy. By May, he had settled on a daring site well south of the Midtown Business District at the corner of 34th Street and 5th Avenue, where the old Waldorf Astoria still stood. Before the year was out, the financing was in place, along with the legendary construction firm, Starrett Brothers and Eakin, and an architect, William Lamb, to whom Raskob put a simple, breathtaking question. Bill, how high can you make it so it won't fall down? The builder of the building actually was commissioned by Raskoff to do some studies to find out what was the maximum building that could be built. And the report came back that um, 65 stories would be ideal and 85 stories was the absolute upper limit of technology as it existed. By settling on 34th Street, which is actually off the beaten track, uh, he's gambling a bit and he needs a bold and dramatic gesture to in fact win tenants to that uh, space. And he does it, of course, by opting to build the tallest building in the world. On August 29th, 1929, just two days after the stock market hit its all-time peak, news of the staggering project was dramatically unveiled by New York's famous favorite son, Al Smith. Good to his word, Raskob had made the ex-governor president and chief spokesman of what was now officially called the Empire State Building. It is a spectacular gesture. If the owners are right, they might fix the center of the metropolis. If they are wrong, they will have the hooting of the experts in their ears for the rest of their lives. Fortune magazine. The northward march of progress, the growth and development of the city, makes it necessary that this historic structure, known around the world, be removed to make room for the largest office building in the world, towering into the air, more than 80 stories high. Now, gentlemen, stand back while I start the real work of demolition. <laughs> in October 1929, the very month the stock market began its tremendous downward spiral, Work on the Empire State Building began with the demolition of the Waldorf Astoria. One month later, as the economic crisis worsened, Al Smith called another news conference. Far from scaling back his plans, Raskob had decided to add a massive 200-foot tall tower to the top of his 85-story building. The stunning spire, itself as tall as a 17-story building, would raise the final height of the structure to an insuperable 1,250 feet, a full 202 feet higher than the Chrysler Building, its gleaming rival 10 blocks to the north. Even more astonishing than the tower itself was its proposed function. It would serve, Smith solemnly explained, as a giant mooring mast for transatlantic dirigibles arriving from Europe, allowing passengers to dock a quarter of a mile in the sky over midtown Manhattan. Experts dismissed the scheme at once, but nobody seemed to care. The vision of the city's tallest tower serving as a port of call for airships from around the world fired the public imagination as nothing else had. Seven weeks later, on January 22, 1930, work on the foundations of the mighty building began. The Empire State Building is not only an incredible icon, 
it also has the ironic role in this story of coming really after the crash of the stock market, being the kind of like the guest who arrives too late at the party. Nobody had a job suddenly. There were no more skyscrapers. Construction was almost nothing. They had a budget. They had to build the building as quickly as possible in the hopes of getting some tenants in. As the months wore on, and the anticipated upturn in the stock market failed to materialize, the economic situation began to deteriorate across the country. And yet, even as the worst depression in American history began to settle around them, New Yorkers were greeted by an astounding sight as the bare steel girders of Smith and Raskob's building began to rise like an immense metal phoenix in the middle of Manhattan Island. A symbol of hope in the darkest of times and a defiant declaration that the city and country would survive. A hundred years before, DeWitt Clinton had flung the Erie Canal across the Empire State, colonizing the hinterlands of America and filling out the grid plan of the city. Now, another generation of New Yorkers was colonizing space itself, turning the grid on end and projecting it straight up into the sky as the Empire State Building. It's incredible today and it's an irrepeatable achievement but the way that it was engineered in terms of the organization of the work was the, the genius, really, of the project of the Empire State Building. And it was the general contractors, Sterrett Brothers and Eakin, who had long been known for their large-scale projects. These projects were uh, always organized in uh, with the greatest efficiency and with a, a kind of, of military genius. And in fact, uh, William Sterrett, one of the Sterrett brothers, wrote that building skyscrapers is the nearest peacetime equivalent of war. Half a century of expertise in building skyscrapers on the island of Manhattan would go into the construction of the Empire State Building a heroic feat of engineering and workmanship by any measure, at any time, let alone in the dark winter of 1930. At the peak of construction in August 1930, 3,439 men were employed on the building, whose 50,000 massive steel beams and columns, each weighing more than a ton, and milled to tolerances of less than an eighth of an inch thick, were being assembled like a giant three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Ordered to exact specification from steel mills in Pittsburgh, shipped by train to New Jersey, barged across the Hudson, and trucked along precisely choreographed routes in Manhattan to the building site at 34th and 5th, where, just 18 hours after leaving the mill in Pennsylvania, nine massive derricks lifted them in place and workmen fitted them together. Some of the steel that was erected was still warm from the fabrication. The steel was reaching the job uh, some 15 or 18 or 20 hours after fabrication uh, uh, and was still hot to the touch. Uh, that's pretty unique. In an age that had perfected the assembly line for manufacturing cars and consumer goods, the Starrett brothers had perfected the first assembly line for manufacturing skyscrapers. The work progressed so rapidly that people could scarcely believe their eyes, the building seeming to leap into the sky as workmen added four to five new stories a week and sometimes as much as a floor a day. In one extraordinary 22-day period, 22 new floors were erected. Also because of the Depression, there was an almost an infinite supply of willing men to work, and there was a fear among those men that they would be laid off, there'd be 10 other guys waiting down on the street to take their place. So therefore, individual production rates actually climbed with respect to bricklayers and other workmen that were gauged by their by piecework, by the number of pieces they did a day. Even though those men knew with, with, with um, direct certainty that when their job was over, um, they were going to either the unemployment line or very likely the bread line. By midsummer, all eyes were bent upon the majestically rising structure, 
now clearly visible from every part of the city. For the crowds of onlookers that gathered each day on the streets far below, and for the teams of photographers and newsmen that eagerly followed every detail of the operation, the real heroes were the gangs of riveters, hundreds of men working in teams of four, laboriously joining the steel framework together, piece by piece. Hanging from beams a thousand feet in the sky, the gangs performed their dangerous tasks at high speed with clockwork precision. Heating, tossing, catching, and driving home the red-hot rivets of steel. 400 rivets were each eight-hour day at $1.92 an hour with a half hour off for lunch. <laughs> 